Uh, so I'm going to talk about what physiology can do for us to understand uh, the future of this planet. That sounds big, didn't it? <laughs> so I'm going to talk about what might happen to organisms, especially animals and especially fish, uh, during the next hundred years if uh, temperature continues to rise and CO2 levels continue to increase on this planet. So these are what happened so far with the CO2 levels. Uh, you can see they're rising. Right now they're around 400 uh, ppm in the atmosphere or micro atmospheres, 400 micro atmospheres. This is uh, the heat content of the ocean also increasing and uh, how will this affect animals in, in the water? One concept that has been studied quite a bit the last few years is the aerobic scoop concept. Initially uh, suggested by Fry in the 1940s, promoted in the, the, during the lot, last years by Hans Otto Pöttner and uh, Tony Farrell. And essentially what, what it says is that it's the aerobic scope of an animal that, gives, that, that uh, sets the limits to the performance of the animal. And the aerobic scope is then the difference between resting or basal metabolic rate and the maximum rate of oxygen uptake. And at some critical temperature, these curves will meet. All the oxygen uptake that the animal can achieve will just go to maintaining basal functions. And anything above that, the animal will soon be very dead. Uh, and this is a very temperature dependent uh, uh, thing, the aerobic scope. So at high temperatures, the aerobic scope will get smaller and smaller. And how will this affect animals? I will later also talk about how CO2 directly can affect them. But I will start with talking about temperature. Uh, so the, the, this uh, uh, concept has also been called oxygen-limited thermal tolerance uh, uh, hypothesis, meaning that the, the thermal tolerance of animals is limited by the, the oxygen supply that the animal can give to its tissues. And it can be further reduced by things like carbon dioxide and especially hypoxia. Obviously, when there's less oxygen in the environment, there's even a more narrow area where you have enough aerobic scope for doing important things in life which for an animal and us is feeding, growing, and reproducing. The rest is less meaningful. Uh, and it's also been suggested that tropical species may be most at risk because they have a narrower temperature range compared to species around uh, our latitudes. So, so the, the red here is the predicted temperatures in 100 years from now. This is the, the gray is the temperatures we have right now. And the tropical species are often living already at the limit of their tolerance, while our uh, higher latitude species around here uh, have a much broader temperature range because they're exposed to much broader temperature changes. So around the equator, one of the most biodiverse habitats we have are, uh, is coral reefs. And that's what I'm going to talk a lot about, what's going to happen to species on coral reefs. One reason why I'm interested in this is also that although I'm Swedish, I don't like Scandinavian winters. <laughs> so I found a place to escape. It's up here, the northern tip of Queensland. And it, up there, there is a research station on the Great Barrier Reef called Lissad Island. If you're very rich, you can stay at the resort here also. And that's where Bill Gates and Hollywood stars stay. But if you're more... A, a normal scientist, you can stay at a research station here and even get paid by your taxpayers to stay there. At Lizard Island, uh, you have a summer water temperature around 29 centigrees. It's 14 degrees south, about 500 kilometers south of New Guinea, and it's a very tropical place. And, and all what you can see around here is coral reefs, and this is the outer barrier of the Great Barrier Reef. It was discovered by Captain Cook as and, and he was the one that named it, as most things around the Queensland coast. He named it because of all the lizards on this island. These are guanas, as the Australian call them, Mavarinid lizards, uh, which dance and mate and feed like uh, the rest of us. That's from our kitchen in one of the, uh, the dormitories for the, for the researchers. Uh, these are projections of what's going to happen to temperature on the the Great Barrier Reef over the next 100 years. And uh, the worst case scenario, we might have an increase from 29 to maybe 34 centigrees. Uh, the best case scenario is an increase from 29 to 31 centigrees. 
And this might not sound much, but it's quite a lot, we think, for the animals living in this already almost heat-stressed environment. So the first experiments we did now maybe five, six years ago, when we started looking at the, these fishes from a global change perspective, was just to do some simple acclimation for a week uh, at today's temperature and at some higher temperatures, 31 to 33 centigrade. And then we measured aerobic scope by measuring resting and the maximum rates of oxygen uptake. Uh, this is one example. Uh, this is a, a damselfish. This is the maximum rates of oxygen uptake it can achieve when we sw swim it. And this is uh, the resting rate. And you can see the tendency of a Q10 increase in, in, in resting oxygen consumption. And this one is the, the aerobic scope in percent. So it's essentially uh, this one divided by that one. And you can see there is a significant fall at 33 centigrade. Maybe not too worrying for this damselfish. But we looked at other fishes. This is a cardinal fish species. And here you can see what we typically see. There is no temperature, really no increase in, in, in maximum rates of oxygen uptake with temperature while the resting rate of oxygen that needs is sharply increasing. And here aerobic scope essentially goes down to zero centigrade. And these cardinal fishes, we couldn't acclimate for more than a week. They would start dying off. They actually had run out of their, if we kept them at 33 centigrade, they had run out of their aerobic scope. This is in, uh, a cousin to the other one, another species of cardinal fish. And here, the maximum rate of oxygen uptake crashes at 33 centigrade, and there is no scope left for it. So this four centigrade increase in temperature, at least for adult fish, would be disastrous. And it could not, they could not acclimate as, as adults to this. And you, you, we see differences between fish groups. So cardinal fishes are highly sensitive, lose almost all their aer aer aerobic scope. Damser fishes are more tolerant. And if things like this happen, biodiversity is likely to go down and we will have change in, in community structures on the reef. So what about hypoxia in a warmer future? Uh, hypoxia will obviously reduce the, 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 the capacity of the animal to sustain its oxygen needs. What we started off doing maybe the first time I came to this island was 12 years ago, I think, and I've been there every winter since. Uh, we started out looking at the hypoxia tolerance of fishes, mainly because no one had done that before. So we needed to do, have some reason for going there. And we, we measure the critical rates of oxygen consumption by us putting them in respirometers. So this is the oxygen concentration in the water. This is the oxygen consumption of the fish. And for a quite wide range of oxygen levels, it can maintain the resting oxygen consumption until it reaches this critical oxygen concentration, it falls off. What was striking when we did this was that uh, we found that almost all fishes, essentially all small, small coral reef fishes we put in the respirometers were quite hypoxia tolerant could take 20 or 30% of air saturation while still maintaining their resting rate of oxygen consumption. If temperature rises, that will of course bring this line up because metabolic rate rises and you will get a new and higher critical oxygen tension, which means they're less hypoxia tolerant. And this is the reason why the need to be hypoxia tolerant we found is that even if the, this reef is a paradise in daytime where the fishes swim around in well oxygenated water at night, Small fishes hide among the coral, like you can see here. And if you put an oxygen electrode in between the branches of the coral, you will see there's only maybe 10, 20 percent of air saturation in the water. It's severely hypoxic. And the reason they're in there is that death is close by. You have predators around that want to eat these small guys. So they need to be hypoxia tolerant to escape predators at night. So we also looked at that, what happens to the critical oxygen tensions of these coral reef fishes. Uh, and this is just some different acclimation times, but acclimation as adults had no effect. And you can see here resting rates of oxygen consumption goes up with temperature, and so does the critical oxygen concentration. So they're less hypoxia tolerant. Here they need around 40, 45 percent of air saturation to maintain the resting rate of oxygen consumption if they're at 32 centigrade. This is just another species showing about the same thing. They lose hypoxia tolerance. So that's another question. Will they be hypoxia tolerant enough in the future to hide from predators at night. There's some more extreme examples of hypoxia tolerant animals also on the reef. This is a picture I took walking the reef at night at a low tide. So I just walked out 
between the, the corals and I found this fish lying in a coral. So there's actually a fish lying there, if you can't see it, you can zoom in on it a bit. And this fish is a, a goby, it's called Gobiodon hystrio, and it's one of the most coward fishes in the world. It will never leave this coral. If it ends up, two of the same sex ends up in the same coral, one will just change sex so they can live happily together in that coral. Uh, so they stay there all the time, and these corals will become hypoxic at night. And the great thing with working in a high biodiversity habitat uh, or area like the Great Barrier Reef is that you can find a lot of examples of seedling species. So there are two very similar uh, species of Gobiodon that overlap in the distribution around where Lizard Island is, around here. But one of them go all the way up to the equator. This one is have a f more southerly distribution. So obviously this guy likes a bit colder water than, than this guy here. So the question is, could we see then differences in, uh, in their tolerance to temperature uh, that could explain why they have different distributions? So we measured aerobic capacities like resting rates of oxygen consumption and, and critical oxygen concentration in these two species over different temperatures up to 33 centigrade. And we don't see a difference here. They, they, they both have the same critical oxygen concentra concentration and respond to temperature in a similar way. But if we left them in the respirometer after they, they consumed most of the oxygen and were below the critical oxygen concentration, we could see differences. So here, we, we call, what we did was we left them there until they flipped over and we had to take them out. And we call that oxygen end. They didn't die, they actually recovered quite quickly when we took, the, took them out. And then the species differentiate here. So you can see the one with the more southern distribution, the colder liking species, uh, flips over at a much higher rate, uh, uh, level of oxygen. And this is the anaerobic time, how long they would s survive in the respirometer. And also there, there's a significant effect. The, 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 tropical one is doing better at high temperatures. So in addition to an aerobic scope, maybe you also have to look at the anaerobic scope of these animals. Let's see, I'm doing a time here. So back to aerobic scope. My friend Philip Mundy at James Cook University in Townsville, Queensland has taken this subject very seriously. He's an ecologist and he set up big colonies of fishes to see what happens if you give them a long time to acclimate and even look at the next generation to see if there is a hope for, for these animals. And these are supposed to be fixed, but <laughs> jump back again. Uh, so this is a, a Mac PC problem here with the centigrees that have been jumping around. But essentially this is the way he's, he set up his colonies. So he had eight breeding pairs and he kept them at three different temperatures, current day temperature, 1.5 centigrees and three centigrees above current day temperatures. Uh, and then he also took uh, these different ones and bred them to an F2 generation. <coughs> so the current day ones, he could look at acute effects. He could also look at the effect after growing up at a higher temperature for about a year from the egg stage to uh, adulthood. And then he could look at transgenerational effects also on these colonies. And what he, or his PhD student, Jennifer Donaldson, found uh, was that, well, with no acclimation, you have these striking effects that we saw before with a strong fall in aerobic scope. So this is the aerobic scope at uh, three different temperatures. So this is the warm temperature here. And you can see how it's fallen. Uh, if you let them grow up at a high temperature, at least the three centigrade group that grew up at a three centigrade high temperature had a significantly higher aerobic scope at, at, at uh, 31.5 centigrees in this case. So something happened there that we could maybe call developmental plasticity. They, they were doing better. They were at the same time a bit skinnier, so there were some trade-offs in this. But the, the more amazing thing that they found was in the second generation, where the parents had grown up at high temperatures, you had higher, you had aerobic scopes at these warmer testing temperatures that were the same as uh, in, the, in the controls. So something had really happened there. The, the parents somehow primed their offspring for this high temperature. So there's some hope in this, but this is just one species then, of course, that we know this happens in. 
So the mechanism behind this we don't really know, but it suggests there could be some epigenetics going on where, where their parents uh, prime their offspring or improve their aerobic scope at least. Now I'm going to jump from temperature to carbon dioxide to look at the possibility that carbon dioxide itself has some effect on these animals. And these are different projections of what's going to happen to our CO2 levels in the atmosphere in the future. The worst case scenario, which is the track we're actually on right now, if we don't change anything, we're going to end up with about 1,000 ppm or 1,000 microatmospheres of, of CO2 in about 100 years from now, compared to the 400, we just, the 400 limit we just passed. So would this have any physiological effects? And my gut feeling first was that no. I mean, these are extremely low CO2 levels in a physiological context, at least if you if you're used to the human physiology textbook where your PCO2 in blood would be around 46 mil six millimeters of mercury. The effect uh, on the PCO2 in water due to these rising levels in the atmosphere would be maybe an increase from 0.3 to 0.76 millimeters of mercury. And you would, as a human, have an enormous gradient for releasing CO2 still. Blood CO2 in fish is much lower than in air breeders. And the, the reason for this is that uh, CO2 has a really high solubility in water. So when, when a water breeder needs to get to the oxygen, it will at the same time lose a lot of CO2. And you end up with something like three millimeters of mercury. That's the, the fish physiology textbook uh, value measured in things like rainbow trout, uh, the, the, the pet animal of fish physiologists. And that this would mean that maybe in the future they had to increase that from three to 3.5 millimeters of mercury to maintain the same gradient or release of CO2. So it didn't worry me too much, but my friends then in Townsville, Phil Monday and others, they were ecologists and they didn't see why they, <laughs> why they shouldn't test this anyhow. So they did, and they found some really striking effects. They, 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 one of the first things they tested was the olfactory preferences of coral reef fish larvae, the small, small, small offspring of, of the reef fish. And it turned out, instead of shying the, the smell of predators, with, which they normally do, they really avoid to be in a water flume here, we have predator smell coming in one channel, they would stay here instead. They became attracted to the smell of predators. Strongly attracted, actually. They also became attracted to the wrong smell of plants. So, so if they want, wanted as a small larvae to find a coral reef, that would be a problem because they suddenly got attracted to the smell of swamp plants instead of typical runoff water from a coral reef. So this was quite striking. What they also found was that this effect occurs first after a few days, at least more than two days of high CO2 exposure. This was about 1,000 ppm or 800 to 1,000 ppm. Uh, so it's not affected by the normal diurnal uh, variations in CO2. You will have hypercapnia on the reef when you have hypoxia because uh, it's all due to respiration on the reef. Uh, and the effects lingers on for about four days at least, which meant that they could actually do field studies. So they had uh, exposed these animals in the lab for about four or five days to high CO2, and then they put them out onto the reef. They were still affected then by the high CO2, and they looked at things like how far away they would venture from a shelter out on the reef, this bit of coral here, and also how bold they were. So if they poked them with a pencil, they took the time, how long a time it would take for them to come out from the shelter again. And what they found was that at, a, uh, at those exposed to 850 ppm in this case, they ventured further away from the shelter and they were bolder, they came out quicker from the shelter. And this is not good things, especially if you combine that with being attracted to the smell of predators. So they also looked at survival of these animals out in, uh, in the field, animals that have been exposed to high CO2. And one thing that coral reef fish larvae are really good at is dying. So if you put them out in the field, this should be 100, 100% of survival. In about 10 days, your controls, 50% of them will be lost, gone, eaten by predators. Uh, so, but, so there's a high mortality, but there's also a lot of offspring being produced. But those that have been exposed to high CO2 were completely gone after 60 hours here. Uh, and there was more than 90% loss after one and a half day. So obviously, it wasn't good what CO2 had done to their behavior. So how can these modest increases then in, in, in CO2 in the water have such drastic effects on their behavior? They must be doing something with the brain, obviously. 
Well, maybe this three millimeters of mercury that you see in textbooks is not really what all fishes have. I found this paper by Bob Bottelier on Atlantic mackerel that he had cannulated and then was swimming in a swim tunnel at higher and higher speeds. And uh, at 100 centimeters per second here, the blood PCO2 of this mackerel was around one millimeter of mercury. And this, when swimming fast, obviously means it has a high rate of gas exchange with the water, to get, needs to get a lot of oxygen. At the same time, obviously, it's losing CO2. And this is probably also true for these coral reef fish larvae. They're very small, so you can't cannulate, and they're about one centimeter long, uh, weight maybe 10, 20 milligrams. But uh, they have really high rates of oxygen consumption for being a fish. These are actually the highest rates of oxygen consumption ever measured in fish. One reason being they're very small and have a very high metabolic rate. But it shows that they have a high gas exchange with the surroundings. So probably their PCO2 is quite close to that of the water, their internal PCO2. And obviously then changes like this, in at least percentage-wise, will have significant effects on, on their blood chemistry. So when I saw these results from my friends in Australia, I, I was thinking, I was going back to my background, I, I actually, 20, 25 years ago now, I took a PhD in neurochemistry. And uh, I was thinking about one particular ion channel in the brain, the GABA-A receptor, or the GABA-A channel which is a chloride bicarbonate channel. And these are exactly the two ions that you would expect to change in an animal exposed to high CO2, to a fish exposed to high CO2. It, it, it regulates its blood pH by, change, by increasing bicarbonate and extruding chloride. So these, these, these things could be changing. And I thought there might be a way of testing this also uh, if the gradients are changed. Uh, another reason why I thought of this is that it's quite well known in mammals that th these gradients can uh, even be reversed. So the, the normal inhibitory GABA-A receptor can become excitatory, and this happens in all fetal mammals and probably all fetal vertebrates, and it's a, a normal part of brain development. Uh, it also happens in some forms of epilepsy that you have altered gradients making the, the GABA-A receptors excitatory. And a way to test this could be to give a mild dose of a blocker of the GABA-A receptor to see if that do anything to the, 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 the behavior of the fish. Uh, I hadn't got around to do this until I arrived on Lizard Island one winter, and, which is the Australian summer, and found uh, my friend uh, Paolo Dominici from Sardinia there. He, he's uh, one of these animal physiologists that focus on how animals move. First, I couldn't find a picture of him, so I just took one when I searched for Sardini on the net, but then I actually found a picture of him, so that's what he really looks like. He, he, he works for, for environmental agency there, and I wonder what he was doing there. I, I knew him from before, but I didn't know he would be on the island. He, he, so he told me what he was doing. He was looking at lateralization of animals or fishes, and I didn't know at the time that fish were lateralized, but essentially they are like us. They're left-handed or right-handed, at least a, a lot of them. The way he tested this was to chase them back and forth in a T-maze like this, double T-maze, and to check if they were turning left or right. And uh, in the fish he was studying, uh, there was about 50% of the population very lateralized. So animals that were lateralized would always turn left or always turn right when he was chasing them. The other half didn't do this. And more amazingly, he found that the ones that he had exposed to high CO2 completely lost their lateralization. There were no individuals in, in those high exposed uh, fish that showed lateralization. So I thought this is a very really neat and quick experiment if I just can get hold of a, a GABA receptor blocker. In fact, I ordered bicuculin and it uh, turned out that that was impossible because it's on the sigma hazardous chemical list. So it would take a month to get it to Lizard Island. It had to go by train and boat. Uh, so I, I continued to look for other alternatives and it turned out that the GABA scene sigma had forgot to put on the hazardous chemical list. And it's a if anything, more specific and more potent GABA receptor blocker. So we got that flown in within three days. Uh, so that's essentially the reason why we used that drug, but it's also apparently quite a good drug. So the hypothesis that we're testing was that maybe we have a reversal of this gradient in the future seawater regulatory changes in the fish will lead to altered gradients of neuronal membranes. And maybe we could see if GABA scene affected this. So we came up and while I was waiting for GABA scene to arrive, I, I, I looked in the literature and found a paper on, on mice 
where they use a, a dose of five milligrams per kilo to have some uh, minor behavioral effects of it. Uh, so I thought we'd start testing that and hopefully it will also penetrate the gills and come into the fish if we have bath the, the fish in some seawater with gabazine. So we did that and 30 minutes was just an arbitrary time that sounded right. And we did two runs. First we tested the fish the way Paula had done it and then we put them in the jar for half an hour. No, obviously we had to have a control so we had the seawater control, same type of jar. And then we ran them again to see if it had an effect. And uh, this is probably the most exciting experiment I've ever done because it also worked. <laughs> so these are the controls here. You can see this is, uh, you don't really need to know what the lateralization index is, but the higher it is, the more lateralized the population is. And these are very lateralized fish than when it's around 40, 50 percent. And uh, this is run one, this is run two, and if anything, it's slightly lower here, but it's not significant. Maybe they just got tired of being tested for lateralization. This is if you take control fish and treat them with GABA seen in this jar, there's no significant effect of that. These are the CO2 treated fish, and if you have a lateralization index around 30, that means that essentially your fishes are, are swimming at random, but you will have some by chance swimming more to the left, so you, you don't get down to zero. And this is what GABA seen did to them. It completely reversed the effect of CO2, and they were all now at, at least as lateralized as uh, the controls. So this was, I think, a strong indication that there's something going on with the GABA receptor. Uh, Phil Mande went back to, to, to Townsville to test this on fish in his uh, uh, olfactory test set uh, up and found the same thing. So, so this is now controls showing that this is the time spent in the predator cube. And you can see there's a break here in, in the bar. If they are controlled fish at n a normal CO2 levels, they would only spend maybe 2% of the time in the, in, in the smell of the, of the predators. They would completely avoid the smell of the predator. Gabasin treatment doesn't do anything to that. These are CO2 uh, treated fish, and they now spend 95% of their time in the smell of the predator. So it's a really bad thing to do. Gabasin doesn't change that, but the CO2 fish, uh, if you treat them with ga this is controlled seawater, sorry. This is the Gabasin treatment, and now you're below the breakpoint, so they only now spend 8% of the time with the predator, and uh, 92 or 12% and 88% of the time out of the predator uh, water. So Gabasin could almost completely restore their olfactory preferences also. And now last year when I went to Lizard Island, I, I got involved in this type of experiment about learning. Uh, there's a very easy way of teaching these small damselfish larvae something, and that is you can teach them to avoid predator smell by simultaneously exposed them to an alarm substance, and they have an innate uh, capacity to, to avoid alarm substance. And if you wonder what alarm substance is, it's uh, something released from an injured conspecific from the, sh the, the, the shells of the side, or the scales on the side of the fish. If you expose them to those two smells at the same time, this guy will be much better at avoiding predator smell. And what uh, Maud Ferrari and her husband, Doug Shivers, both from Saskatchewan in Canada, but also fleeing to Lizard Island in the winter. Uh, what they had found the previous year was that CO2 exposure will block this learning, and they, they won't avoid predator smell anymore. So the first thing we wanted to test if, uh, is what, if we could also here use gabazine to fix these animals, so if this was also a gabaergic problem that, that affected their learning. And then we also wanted to bring these guys out onto the reef to see if they survived better or worse. So the setup was like this. We exposed them for several days to CO2. We stopped that at day zero, end of CO2 exposure. And then they did this learning trial with or without garbazine treatment. And then we tested them if they learned to avoid predator smell. And then we also tested at day one and also at day six. And then we released fishes out onto the reef. Uh, this is a bit complicated. The paper is now in press in Global Change Biology, I think. Uh, so I got this from Doug Shivers. But essentially what it shows is the redu reduction in feeding strikes in control fish here when, when uh, exposed to the smell of the predator and moon grass in this case. If they've been exposed to high CO2, 900 ppm, they didn't show this learning. Uh, but what also what we found in day one here is that the gabazin treatment did not really fix this at day one. But uh, the same with activity. So these are two indices of uh, 
avoidance, uh, I mean, this is a fair, fair thing now. They, they will freeze and don't move so much. So this is how active they are. Line crosses in, a, in an aquarium. And what you can see is that uh, the ones that learn to avoid the smell, the control the uh, CO2 level, uh, they, they, they are much less active. Gabazin did not fix this either. But then at day six, five days later, the same fish, we just tested them again. Now Gabazin had had an effect. Obviously, they had learned something at day, day zero that they could express at day six, but not at day one. The same with activity, also Gabazin could fix that. So what's happening here? Well, what we know is that the CO2 effects remains for several days if they've been exposed to high CO2. But Gabazin apparently took them out of this CO2 mist that the, their brain was in. So they could learn, but they couldn't express it the next day because Gabazin had worn off and they were still in the back in the, so they were now back in the CO2 mist. But at day six, they could express this. So they had learned something. And when we put them out on the reef, this is his survival curves again. The short story here is that Gabazin was very potent in fixing this. So that the ones that have been treated with high CO2 and given Gabazin showed a much higher survival rate here, the same as controls that have been learning at low CO2 levels, compared to those fish that had been CO2 exposed. They quickly disappeared from the reef, being eaten by predators. So what's going on? What, this is just a slide showing what we're thinking about and what we're doing right now. Uh, since it takes several days for this effect to set in, we have cloned all the subunits of the GABA-A receptor and the, the pumps are responsible for pumping chloride in and out of, of, of neuronal membranes and also in and out of fishes to see if there is some change in gene expression going on, something being induced. Uh, obviously, it's not an acute direct effect of CO2 because it takes several days and it also lingers on. So what about fishes closer to home? Is this, also, is this only happening in coral reef fishes? And uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, my friend from Sweden, Fredrik Gutfeldt from Gothenburg, came out with a paper in PLOS One where they tested sticklebacks, which is a, a species occurring all over the Northern Hemisphere, all around Britain and all, also both on the Pacific and Atlantic coast of North America. Uh, around Scandinavia, and it even lives both in seawater and freshwater. So it's a good fish to test, and you would maybe expect this to be a very tolerant fish to most things because it can tolerate everything from freshwater to seawater. So he started off testing lateralization. Uh, and this is after 20 days of CO2 exposure or controls, having been in aquaria for 20 days, and this is 40 days. And this is now number of fish that show a certain lateralization. 100 minus means that 100% went left in this test and uh, 100 plus means 100% went right in this test. And you can see in the controls there is few fishes that are completely indifferent. Most show a lateralization. But in the CO2 exposed ones you have uh, quite a few that just are completely unlateralized. So these are significant differences. And after 40 days they are even more significant. So clearly the stickleback brain is also affected. They, they, they show less lateralization when being exposed to high CO2. They also did a novel object test. And Frederick is a fun guy, so he came up with exposing the fish to a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> so he dropped that into the aquarium and uh, he looked at the time they spent investigating this novel object, trying to figure out how to solve this problem. And uh, <laughs> Control fish spent an average 70 seconds investigating the rubric cube, while the CO2 exposed ones only spent a few seconds. They were more or less uninterested in this novel object. So, also here we had an effect of high CO2. I had one more here. Yes. Uh, he also looked at uh, escape time from a chamber. He put the fish into a chamber with one hole, one way out, to see how long it took for them to, to get out of that. Controls took about 30 uh, seconds. The CO2 exposed one, maybe 40 seconds, but there was no significant effect after 20 days. So that really didn't uh, work so well, except when it tested them after 40 days, it turned out the controls now probably had learned from this first uh, ex experiment he did after 20 days. So now they did it in eight seconds or seven seconds, something like that, while the CO2 ones were 
as bad as the first time it took them 30 seconds to get out. So now I had a big significant effect. And I think this is learning more than, than uh, capacities to, to find your way out of a, a box. They learn. And CO2 screw that up too. So now to summarize what I talked about. Uh, if you start with temperature, clearly they're losing aerobic scope if you uh, expose adult coral reef fish to, to uh, to higher temperatures and also lose hypoxia tolerance. And this is also things that have been shown to occur in, in uh, temperate water species, like in, in salmon by Tony Farrell's group and uh, uh, other fishes by, in the North Sea, for example, by, by Pöckner's group. Uh, they show an inability to acclimate as adults, as I said, but uh, what I didn't have time to talk to you about is that it could be latitudinal population differences. But we've seen differences uh, in temperature tolerance between fishes from Heron Island further south on the Great Barrier Reef compared to Lizard Island further north. So maybe we'll have populations adapted to, to a higher temperature from the equator moving southwards or northwards from the equator. But I don't know who's going to stay at the equator if that happens. So. Uh, it could also be phenotypic plasticity. So if you grow up at a high temperature, you do better. We know that happening to one species. And that species also show this transgenerational acclimation, uh, which could be epigenetics. But epigenetics can only do so much. I mean, you can only methylate your genome once, and then um, your offspring will do better, apparently. But what then if temperature continues to rise? So maybe then most hope would li lie in natural selection. The problem with that is that these animals are now uh, not seen these high CO2 levels for maybe 20 or 30 million years. That's what the geologist tells us. That was 20 or 30 million years ago that we, we'd had so high levels as 1,000 microatmospheres of CO2 in the atmosphere and in the sea. So, so they, if they had adaptations to these, there have been maybe 20 or 30 million generations also where they could have lost this through random mutations if they haven't been, been, been uh, exposed to these conditions. And the same goes for temperature then also. Uh, Coral reef habitats have probably been very constant in temperatures, at least for maybe 10,000 years, something like that. Uh, so we don't know if they are able to, 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 if they have the genes still there that natural selection could work on, and, and random mutations might not be fast enough. And then we have the GABA story also, which is the new one that uh, uh, this obviously an alt altered the uh, function of the GABA A receptor, at least uh, something we can fix with GABA scene, which indicates that. And uh, these receptors occur throughout the nervous system of all vertebrates, and in all, essentially every neural circuit, you have some GABA receptor, the A receptors involved. So, so anything could be affected here. And equally worrying is that it also occurs in many invertebrates. And uh, we have preliminary data showing that snails, for example, also are affected their behavior. And uh, that can also be fixed by GABA scene. So, so, so it might affect a lot of animals. These are the friends involved in what I've been talking about. And then uh, I promised to show some slides here that Tobias gave me to, to advertise the Scandinavian Physiological Society and Dacta Physiologica. Thank you. <laughs>